As a bank that focuses on business, we work with business leaders all day, every day. We have a front row seat to what's working and what has potential. The First Business Bank podcast is dedicated to sharing insights to help you work better, smarter, and faster to achieve your goals. Let's get into the show. Hello, I'm Mark Malloy, CEO of First Business Bank. I'd like to welcome you to another episode of the First Business Bank podcast. Today, we'll talk about management succession planning, an important issue for leaders not only as key employees age towards retirement, but also to be prepared for an untimely and tragic departure. Owners and leaders that aspire to continue the mission or perpetuate a legacy need to think ahead and be strategic about change. It's a process that can be difficult to execute. Where to begin, what messages will be sent, those are some of the questions. And there are a variety of constituencies to consider. The pathway, like many, is often unclear. So today, we hope to help map the journey. I'm joined by two of my colleagues who will introduce themselves before we get our conversation started. Jody. Yes, thank you, Mark. I'm Jody Chandler, the Chief Human Resources Officer at First Business Bank, uh, and I've been with the bank for about 28 years. Corey. I'm Corey Chambis. I'm the President and CEO of First Business Financial Services, and I've only been at First Business Bank for 27 years. Good. Jody, we'll start with you. How do you define management succession planning and maybe give a few examples of how employers approach this from a process standpoint? Sure. Um, I and maybe we define uh, succession planning and or succession management as a transition in leadership. Um, And that sounds pretty simple, yet the whole process and the planning uh, is very complex. Um, We approach it in a couple of different ways, and that really depends on whether we're uh, looking to, you know, or we have identified a specific role in the company that we're looking to find a successor for, or if we're just working organizationally on different talent development initiatives and really building our leadership pipeline. Uh, If we have a specific role identified, there's a process that we go through to help us understand uh, what the role requires and then also help us understand the different characteristics and traits of the individual to make sure that we have a good fit for the position that we uh, are prioritizing. From an organizational perspective and the talent development initiatives, they're just ongoing initiatives that we're working on year after year after year and uh, kind of fine tuning and evolving those initiatives. But it really does start with our strategic plan and looking at what uh, the organization needs to be capable of doing over the course of the next three to five years in order to execute that strategic plan. We also utilize some external partners and or professionals to help us bring some uh, objectivity to our process. And um, we do a lot of executive coaching and can really tailor development then for an executive around the gaps that we may see in terms of their readiness uh, for a role. And this process just continues to cascade through our organization. Um, And we do other individual development plans uh, as appropriate and establish performance goals for all of our employees in the company that, again, if you roll that all up, really aligns nicely with our strategic plan. So we've kind of got a two-prong approach, uh, really kind of tailoring it to a specific role or a specific position, uh, and then also doing it more broad-based and developing around the competencies. Good, thanks. Corey, when one thinks of succession planning, it's easy to think of a case of a company president or a senior leader who's nearing retirement. But talk about other applications of succession planning. You mentioned two things really there. One is role, another was timing. You mentioned retirement, so start with that on the timing. When it's a retirement that's the more, typically more orderly, you know what's coming, Uh, You should be having those kind of conversations with folks on a regular basis about what their plans are and what their timeline is. So if you have a a retirement, that's that's a a little simpler in most cases uh, because you know it's coming. There's also the unexpected situation, uh, and there you need to have, in case of emergency, break glass scenario. What do you do if something suddenly happens? And that could be an interim or a temporary situation. So 
for senior kind of positions, you should really have both a thoughtful, oh, in maybe five plus years, this person's going to be retiring. How are we moving toward an outcome there? But what if something happens suddenly? What would we do? How would we we fill that role on, on an interim basis? Um, the other part you, you asked about was role because, yeah, you think about the, the leader of a company and a succession plan there, but there are a lot of people in organizations who are uh, critical um, in, in terms of their specialized role um, and technical abilities. And so you have to think about that. And most organizations have that. People who um, there's one person who does this thing and who has the technical expertise. So you you really should be looking at those kind of roles in the same sort of way, um, both longer term planning for a successor, and then what would you do in case of emergency? Um, and then the other would be people who have uh, very specialized, unique relationships, client relationships. What would you do um, relative to the salesperson who has worked with your largest customer for the last 20 years and they're, you know, they're really tight. And that's why you don't ever worry about that client leaving because they're really close to that salesperson. Well, what if something happens to that salesperson suddenly and, or what about that salesperson retiring, which uh, eventually everybody will. So those kind of roles, you also have to be thinking about um, working in uh, developing more of a team approach to a secondary uh, person and um, thinking about succession planning and those kind of roles as well. Can the employee themselves be involved in the process? Oh, I think they absolutely should be involved in the process. Um, they should understand that this is something an organization should be doing. If it's if the organization is doing their job, if management is doing their jobs, thinking about these things and, and contingency plans, just like you would for disaster recovery planning purposes, um in, in the you know what if something suddenly happens scenario and then also a more orderly uh, retirement kind of a, a scenario so that person will often be able to identify who both internal and potentially external candidates would be for their job so there may not be an internal candidate in in, in some cases for some roles but they may know a peer of theirs who is somewhere else. And so they should be able to provide you a short list of that in case of emergency scenario. Um, they would know what the development plans need to be for those people to be ready. Um, so they absolutely should be involved. Jody, maybe on the other uh, side of this, um, sometimes it might be hard for an employee to leave, especially if they've been a long-term employee. So talk about strategies and, and how to approach that. Sure. Um, you know, I think it really comes down to having really good communication with the employee, uh, having some honest conversation, really learning and understanding what's important to that employee as they're departing and exiting uh, the company. The more we can work together on a plan, I think the better the outcome is going to be for both the individual and for the company. Thinking about things, again, that are important to the individual, what they'd like their legacy to be as they leave. Um, finding ways to celebrate that individual and their contributions that they've made to the company as they're starting to exit the company is really important, too. Uh, it can really be a positive event. It doesn't need to be a negative event. Uh, and the more you work together on the plan, I think the better uh, outcome you'll have. Jody, what's the what's the time frame required to properly put a plan in place? From an internal perspective, if you've got internal candidates identified, if you're fortunate enough to have multiple internal candidates identified, um, they could be at very different points in their careers, and their timelines could be very different from one another. Um, but you, you really can't start too soon. Um, it takes years of development if you're really going to execute it uh, orderly and have the person really be able to get the experiences that they need and develop the competencies that are critical. Uh, you really need years to do that. If you're going externally, um, you know, we have found in our uh, experience that it takes us 
months um, and months that add up to more than a year. Again, to do to do a good job, really being able to find the talent that you're looking for, kind of diversify your talent pool and slate. It takes time, and you need to allow that time. Uh, kind of going back to what Corey was saying, um, you know, this this maybe would all hold true in the instance of having a, a known event and some time to really work with. When you end up in an emergency situation, you know, your timeline might change a little bit. Um, but again, from an external perspective, it does not happen overnight. The other thing uh, reminds me of a panel discussion that I was listening to in the last few years about a CEO that had tried to execute his own succession plan, you know, in conjunction with the board of that particular company. And he explained um, that they didn't get it right the first time with the person that they brought into the organization. And then they didn't get it right the second time. Uh, fortunately for them, third time was the charm um, and they did get it right. But as he reflected back on that process and kind of the learning uh, that took place during that time frame, it was 10 years from the time they started to work on succession planning until they had found a person uh, that they were all comfortable with kind of turning the reins over to. So um, I don't think, you know, 10 years seems like an eternity today. I don't know that we'd have the liberty of taking that much time to do it. Um, so I guess maybe the the, the moral uh, to all of my long-winded answer there is it takes a lot longer than you think. And there are going to be um, circumstances and things that kind of pop up in the process that you're going to need to be able to pivot around. And it's probably going to take um, or just add some more time to the whole time frame of really being able to, to get that successor in the role. So this is something I'm going to address to both of you. I'll start with you, Joe, Deanna, but let's talk about the viewpoints on how transparent to be to your workforce. In the typical case, employees may know a senior leader is near retirement. Does it comfort those employees to know in advance the company is working on a plan or does it cause more concern and chaos? Um, I would say yes and yes. Um, certainly the employees want to know that you're working on a plan um, and that there is a plan in place, but it really does create angst uh, among those especially that are going to be most directly impacted by it. There's a lot of questions. Um, there's a lot of input that you'll get from different individuals throughout the process. You know, I think it's a lot about managing their expectations too, just in terms of the amount of time that it's going to take to fill this role. We do a lot of uh, conversation around talent reviews, talent pipelines, and then also workforce planning. And we're hoping through getting more comfortable with having these conversations and it becoming more normal uh, in our organization that just over time, uh, everybody, you know, everybody's understanding will build around this topic and it will become uh, just a much easier conversation to be able to have with people. I would say, Mark, that one of the the things on this one is it is a little bit of a can of worms. You, If you bring it up and are, are very proactive about talking about it, you are going to be stirring things up and stirring people's thoughts and concerns up. There's there's no question about that. On the other hand, if if it's a, a, a real thing, somebody may be nearing retirement, people are going to be thinking about it. They're going to be talking about it with each other. And it's better to control the narrative and the discussion um, than to have it uh, go on on its own and, and build build a life of its own. I remember uh, I was in a small group meeting with some employees, um, kind of a QA and a thing I, I was doing with a smaller group. Uh, and part of that is they can ask me whatever they want to ask me. And one of them asked me, when are you going to retire? And boy, did that take on a life in that meeting. That it just kept going and there kept being more questions. Well, what was, would would there be an internal candidate or would you look to the outside and et cetera, et cetera. So the, it was obviously on some people's minds. Um, and I think while I had no, I essentially had no answers for them. I, I didn't know when I was going to retire. I didn't tell me anything about who it would be or what it would be or anything like that. 
just talking about it, I think made him feel better. Um, and it was kind of this like thing you couldn't really talk about. And then one person was bold enough to ask the question and then it was sharks in the, you know, blood in the water with the sharks. Um, so I, I think they felt better afterwards. So where it is, where it is a topic that's going to be um, thought about by people, I think it's better for them to know that there is a process, as Jody was talking about, for them to know that you're thoughtful about it and that there is a process is comforting, um, as opposed to, are they planning for this? What will they do? Will they get it right? Will they get it wrong? They feel more like you'll get it right if you have a process, and at least if you're willing to share that aspect of it, and that is something that you think about and work on. So I think letting people know there is a succession planning process, it has a structure, it has a rhythm, you report it to the board on an annual basis, whatever that is, I think is comforting for people to know. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And I don't think it's something that you can completely ignore as as a senior leadership group, and but also recognizing that it changes. I mean, I can like personally ask five or 10 years ago, I said, I don't know that I'm ever going to retire. I'm going to work till I'm in my late 60s. And but that's changed. You know, life circumstances change and people's people's timelines change. So I think open communication with the individual is critical. And then and then an honest approach to how it's being dealt with at the leadership level across the company, to your point, is comforting and, and reassuring to people. And Mark, um, I think just as we've gone through um, a lot of change in the world and, you know, in our own company in the last year with the pandemic, um, I think the remote work options are also going to play into some leaders and executives' timelines, perhaps changing as well. So to your point, um, things change with people, things change with companies all the time. And I think the important thing is, again, to just be dialoguing and communicating and having those honest conversations with people. Again, it's got to work, you know, not only for the executive, but also for the company, too. So lots of considerations on, on both sides of the equation. I totally agree. Corey, uh, in the case where you've had a long-term successful employee who's planning to retire, I'm guessing the instinct would be to hire their clone. Talk about that concept. Yeah, that's definitely the natural instinct. It's it's the easy way, right? If it's working, if the person's done well, you just want mini-me. You want the person that acts and looks and talks just like they do. Um, and that's the easy way to go. Um, so that's natural, um, but it might not be best. Um, I think what you really need to think about there is the future, not the past, because that person was really successful for you in the past, getting you to the present. But now it's about what's the present forward look like. And that could be different. Um, maybe maybe not. Uh, if it's just, you know, mind the store and keep keep it the same, then a, a clone might be great. But if the idea is that there needs to be a, um, some progress made, some evolution, some innovation, then maybe a clone is not the right thing. You have to think about where you wanna go with the business, the business line, the department, whatever it may be, um, and how that all interrelates, and think about the skills and the capabilities that are needed for the future, because they may not be the same. Are you gonna expand? Are you gonna grow? Are you going to new markets? Um, all those kinds of things could be different than what you have done thus far. So it's also comforting potentially for the employees to hire a clone. Uh, it's, it's easy, there's not change. People don't love change. Um, people aren't, don't come in every day saying, hey, could you change some things on me? Um, they want things to be the same. So you will have to overcome that. If you, if you do make a change, if you, if you try to look for something uh, different in the new person, but kind of the, the other side of that coin with change is people don't, um, gravitate to change. So how they've done things is probably how they will continue to do things going forward. So if the retiring person, let's say, um, has built a foundation of doing things in a certain way, those employees are going to keep doing those things the same way. Even if you bring in somebody who's trying to make change. So it's not like you lose all the good that was built, the foundation that was built. 
But if you need to, to do something to get to the next level, that person, that new person can, can add that to the foundation that was built from the prior person. Um, it's a little difficult at times for the employees if you're bringing in somebody very new and different, um, but it can be very healthy and it can also be very energizing because people can get struck, stuck in a rut. They can get comfortable doing what they've been doing. Um, and maybe they're, you know, they were performing at their highest and best and then that kind of plateaued. But somebody new, different ideas, innovative, different perspective can take things to the next level. Mark, if, if I could also interject on that, um, and to your point, Corey, really kind of looking at future state and what are we going to need in the next you know, three years or, or five years out, I recently read that 35% of the skills that are important today won't be five years from now. So what's being executed on today, 35% of what we're working on and the skill set required to do that, it's going to change. It's going to be different five years from now. And the other, the other interesting statistic was uh, 65% of the children that are starting in primary school today, so probably 4K, 5K, they're going to be working in jobs that are not yet invented. We don't even know what they are. So that just tells you, you know, how rapid things change and how rapid those skill sets are changing. So while it might be easy um, to, to put a clone uh, into a role during a succession transition, I think you really, really, really have to challenge and force yourself into thinking about the future state and what's going to be necessary to lead the, the company, the department, the business line into the future. Jody, I'm sure there are instances where employees self-identify that they would like an exit plan or to start working on a succession plan years before they retire. Talk to me about HR's viewpoint on that situation. Yeah, um, you know, I think it's I, I do think it's rare that somebody is starting to talk about it years before they retire. Um, at some companies, there could be monetary benefits, you know, at different points in time in somebody's career. Um, that's not, you know, always the case. So I think it's more rare than common for somebody to really give you a lot of years of advance warning. Um, and I think, you know, again, that that goes back to it becomes a very emotional thing for the employee. And, and it's hard to figure out. It's hard to figure out what the right time is. You know, we've had individuals tell us they don't want to be a, a lame duck. Um, yeah, so if you get too much notice. Irrelevant. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think that's where it really is on the leadership and um, the HR professionals in the organization to start those conversations. So um, appropriate uh, amount of notice is is important, and I think that depends on the position and the role in the company. Jody, you touched on this a little bit before, but when is it appropriate to do it internally versus going outside uh, with uh, third party help? Again, I think there's probably multiple answers to that question, Mark. Um, if you don't have experience with doing succession planning and succession management, in your company, or maybe you just don't have the resources uh, to really commit the time that's required to work on this, you might look to an external partner or an external professional to help you build the, the plan. Um, maybe you know, you're know you not getting the results that you want from your internal efforts. For whatever reason, you know, you're know you not meeting your, your goals or, or the expectations that you've put forth. And you need to understand um, where your gaps are. What do you need to do to augment your process? Talking to external parties, consultants uh, will probably help you identify those. Um, and then maybe also we've talked a little bit about finding yourself in a sudden situation or an emergency situation and you weren't planning on a transition that's taking place now immediately. And utilizing an outside party or consultant can really help bring some objectivity to the whole process when emotions can be pretty high in a sudden situation. Uh, so, you know, there's just a variety of different reasons that you could be looking to uh, partner uh, with somebody with the professional expertise 
on succession management. And, and Mark, I would also say that even if you've built a good process, um, which I, I feel very good about our process, uh, but we also are using outside consultants tools as part of our process. We're not using them to build our process, but we've pulled together a lot of the tools that we use in different ways that are very much a part of the succession planning process. The personality profile screening tool that we use, for example, the cultural competency tools that we use, though that comes from a, a very large high level um, HR consulting firm. We use their competency model. Th those kind of tools come from the outside, but are all put together as part of, of a process that that's our process. And Corey, you're also making me think to um, the executive coaching uh, that we do. We utilize the tools that they know are very, you know, researched and valid in their whole process of doing the assessment and putting development plans together. So again, the, the consulting partnership can take on many different forms and many different uses uh, over time. Yeah. Corey, talk about the uh, pros and cons of promoting from within versus hiring from the outside yeah that's that's probably the the, the hottest topic uh, of all this the pros on the, the hiring from within are you know what you're getting so that's the big one and that flows right to culture um, because you know if you have culture fit or not and you probably do or the person wouldn't be there and wouldn't be a candidate and culture is so important in I think probably almost any business, um, and and for us, we think it's critical. So so that's a big big key. Um, you can get lucky. Um, for example, we we hired our our chief operating officer, um, and it was somebody that several of us had a relationship with for probably ten years. Um, so we knew there was a cultural fit. Um, so when you hire somebody based on a couple of interviews, knowing the cultural fit is gonna be there or not there, that's the roll of the dice on that one. That, that's the risk of, of going to the outside. However, you may not have the skill set. Um, and, and particularly in smaller organizations or smaller um, business lines or smaller departments, you may not have that skill set uh, underneath the leader that's robust enough to, to be at that leader level in that department, business line, whatever it may be. Um, and it, it's just not a large enough to, to be able to afford to have that person waiting in the wings. Um, so you may have to go to the outside. You may be forced to do that because you're not, you don't wanna promote somebody into a role and have them fail. That's that's no good for anybody. Um, so, so that may be the case that you need to go to the outside at times. The other advantage is to bring in diverse ideas um, for diverse experiences. So if somebody's only worked at your company, they know how you do things. But if you're at a point with whatever that function is, that you, need, you know you need to to go to the next level, you need to do things differently. Somebody who's had experience at a larger organization may be able to bring in um, expertise and experiences that nobody in your company has. So looking to the outside for a diversity of experience, um, the, the level that you're going to, having an experience being larger or broader geographically or whatever it may be, there, there's those opportunities to, to bring that in. Um, and then diversity of all sorts in terms of uh, perspectives, backgrounds, whether those be cultural or ethnic or whatever kind of diversity you can think of. If you don't have what you want in your organization, um, as far as that goes, when you anytime you hire, that's that's an opportunity to broaden that. So um, that's another aspect that can come into play in terms of looking to the outside. And Mark, if I could just add again, um, the the benchmark that that we're aware of and that we uh, know is healthy for an organization is if you had three leadership transitions taking place over time, um, kind of the ideal ratio would be that you would fill two of those roles with internal candidates and fill one of those roles with an external candidate. So the healthy balance is that two to one ratio, two internal to one external. 
Mm-hmm. Judy, you touched on this um, kind of throughout the comments, but how does talent management overlap with management succession planning? I think they're completely intertwined. You know, you're constantly working on different initiatives and actions within your organization to develop your talent. If you're working on the right things that tie really closely to your strategic plan and the execution of your strategic plan, uh, over time, you should be developing that pipeline of leadership. Uh, Getting uh, the alignment in terms of timing uh, all correct with this is the challenge. Um, you know, making sure that you're developing people with the skill set and to the competencies that you really need uh, at the right time and at the right place is where the challenge of all of this comes to be. So I think they're very much uh, intertwined and really challenging to, to, to separate. A lot of great thoughts today. Jody and Corey, thanks for taking time to share your experiences with our audience today and to you, our audience. Thanks for listening to this conversation. We hope you found this topic helpful and applicable to your management succession planning process. Let us know if there are other topics or information you'd like to learn about and join us next time on the First Business Bank podcast. If you want more content like what you just heard delivered straight to your inbox, go to firstbusinessbankpodcast.com. And if you haven't already, make sure to subscribe to the First Business Bank podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, please leave a quick rating of the show. Thanks so much for listening. First Business Bank, member FDIC.